So welcome, welcome to this episode of the Alcohol Free Lifestyle Podcast. And I am thrilled to introduce William Porter as our special guest today. William is the author of one of my favorite alcohol free related books, Alcohol Explained. And so I've got a lot that I want to ask William today <laughs> to really share his wisdom with you guys, because this is was a really pivotal book in my alcohol free journey. Um, William is 10 years alcohol free as of February this year. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, he wrote this book and published it back in 2015. So nearly 10 years ago. Um, yeah. William, great to have you with us. I wanted to ask you, first of all, if you could share with our audience what your life looked like just around the time before you made the decision enough's enough and I'm done with this what did life look like for you then it was a it was a bit of a mess I have to say it was <clears throat> so so my drinking I always drank in binges so I'd always it was kind of what we do and I think it's similar to Australia as well where you know there's a big binge drinking culture so you like you hit the weekend and you go out and you drink loads and it's almost like your your entitlement for working hard all week is to then ruin the weekend by drinking loads but so that's what I always did and there were I, I think a few points that it, it's always like a journey of consuming more and more isn't it I think for most people wherever they end up and you know if you look at what you're drinking now compared to 10 years ago there's a sort of a marked increase and for me I can identify a couple of bits where it sort of leapt ahead a bit and one was my military service so I was in the parachute regiment for a few years and served out in Iraq um, and prior to going out, they won't go into all the details, but it started me off morning drinking. So I'd wake up, drink in the morning, kind of in the knowledge that when I went to Iraq, it, it was dry out there at the time. This is back in 2005. So there was no alcohol. So I was kind of like my drinking was getting I was getting into very bad habits with drinking. But I was like, oh, it's all right because I'm going out with like a six months detox, which kind of made sense on one level. But at that time, I didn't really understand that you don't really backtrack <laughs> when you go on, you know, when you stop drinking, you kind of pause, but when you start again, you pretty much go back to where you were. So to cut a long story short, my what my life looked like was I'd usually start drinking Thursday evening, Friday lunchtime, um, and I'd drink through, I'd fall unconscious, I don't know, nine, 10 at night, wake up three, four in the morning, drink again to get back to sleep, wake up then at six seven eight in the morning feeling rubbish and have a few more drinks to get me through and end up drinking loads and then I started to get in as you can imagine you know Sunday I'd start drinking again to get through the Sunday and then of course half the time you're waking up on Monday and no fit state to work so I started ringing in sick on Monday um, and then of course you're sat at home with nothing to do so you start drinking again so it was this kind of binge drinking was getting longer and longer and longer and more unmanageable um I had young children at the time I think my children were sort of like 18 months and six months so they were very little um that again I think I, I sort of struggled with that movement into parenthood and I think again that sort of exacerbated my drinking to a degree um yeah so that was it really so it was it, it was a complete mess and then I think on a it, it was a Tuesday or Wednesday I went out for lunch and just started drinking and I ended up ringing in sick and drinking I went through like five days straight drinking when I sort of came out of it on the weekend my wife had left with the children I hadn't been into work for the best part of a week and that was the point where I said I, I can't keep doing this I just have to stop yeah yeah it's um it's incredible isn't it how it can kind of be quite manageable and f at least i relate to this because mine was manageable and then it, it really went downhill pretty fast like mm. there was like this last sort of month or so where i really noticed okay this is this has got to stop mm. so you got to that enough enough enough's enough moment what did you do then? What was your next step? 
so I didn't have any particular plan in place. I just quit. And my, I think my mindset at the time, if there was any kind of mindset, because after that drinking at that level for like five days straight, you, you're in a bit of a bad way anyway. So I'm not sure I was particularly thinking much of anything other than just, I can't keep doing this. And I think I sort of started the attempt thinking, uh, I cannot keep doing this. I, I'm not going to enjoy social occasions. I'm quite introverted, really. The only thing I enjoyed about social occasions was drinking. Um, so I started off thinking I can't keep drinking, but I'm not going to enjoy social occasions. I'm not going to enjoy holidays or Christmas or family barbecues or anything of that. But I can't keep waking up like this. This is just unmanageable. So I'm going to have to cut out, lose out on this big chunk of pleasure but at the same time, it's got to be done because of all the problems it's causing me. So I think that was my mindset at the time. Um, but I think I had a lot of the knowledge in place. So, so you mentioned, of course, that I stopped drinking just over 10 years ago and Alcoholic Explain was published, you know, coming up to 10 years ago. So it's kind of an odd thing because I quit and I wrote Alcohol Explain quite shortly after I'd quit drinking. Yeah. And I think for me, that day in February 2014, when I quit, I'd already done a lot of thinking about my drinking and why I was doing it and what was drawing me in. And I think I'd done that for years and years. I started smoking when I was about 14. And I think I read Alan Carr, you know, Alan Carr's I Easy Way. Well. Yes. I read, I read it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I read that when I was, I think, about 16 or 17. And it really fascinated me, just his whole approach to smoking and then addiction generally. So I think almost since my late teens, early 20s, although I'd been drinking, I'd been really thinking about it and analysing it through that kind of lens. Mm. So I think when I hit 2014 and I was had to quit... I probably had like 70, 80% of what was in alcohol explained already in my mind, just from, you know, like I would wake up feeling really twitched up and nervous after drinking and I'd wake up unable to sleep when I'd been drinking and I'd be thinking, well, why is that? And I'd start researching into it. So it wasn't with the idea of writing a book or even to sort out my own drinking. It was more just Alan Carr had fired up my kind of interest in addiction and when I was spotting these different things that I noticed when I was drinking, I just sort of research it for my own curiosity, really. So I think inadvertently, when I hit that part in 2014, I had a chunk of knowledge about how it all worked. And I think really that was what allowed me to quit at that time, even though I didn't quite have everything in place at the time. Yeah, you you hit on, you touched on like these beliefs that you had prior to, to quitting, which were almost that kind of deprivation mindset, which we see so mm. often, which is I'm going to have to stop doing this thing and it's going to be painful. And mm -hmm. you wrote a chapter in your book, which I want to get to, which I loved was the mental agony of stopping, which is really something that I want to dive into in a moment. But tell me, um, what, what did you think about your drinking? Like, what was it doing for you when you were drinking? Like, what did you drink for at least in your mind at that point in time before you quit i think like most so uh, nobody i don't think has a perfect life and at that time my life was not perfect it was far from perfect so we had young children our house was it was a house but it was quite small it was like a two bed so very condensed it was it was just about all right for two people but then there was four of us and kids have massive amounts of accoutrements um, so it was very cluttered. I was work. I had a f all right job, but it was way less than I'm getting paid at the moment. So it felt like we were very much struggling financially. Um, the whole thing with young children, of course, put huge amounts of pressure on my marriage as well. I'd always, I I'd left the parachute regiment back in 2006, I think. Um, so although this was a few years down the line, I'd already always had regrets about leaving. It was quite a big part of my life and I felt very detached having left it. So I think I had all this stuff swimming around. And for me, alcohol was like a way of just kicking back and letting it all wash over me. So all these stresses and strains that were like bubbling around everywhere, 
sitting back and having a couple of drinks was almost my way of just relaxing out of it, getting away from it all. So it was, I think that was what was driving me on all the time. It's just, I've got all this stuff going on and alcohol provided me with a bit of release from it. Yeah, yeah. I think that, I mean, that's certainly what we hear on a regular basis is it relieves stress, mm-hmm. uh, it relieves anxiety, yeah. which I know um, I'm going to ask you about in a moment. Um, it helps me sleep better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so let's have a look at those three, actually, like, these are my questions for you. Does alcohol actually relax us? So no, in short, so it's, it's, it's an, it's a sedative, a depressant. And when I use the word depressant, I'm using it in its chemical sense as something that decreases or inhibits nerve activity. Mm -hmm. So when you drink it, you do feel slightly more dull, relaxed, however you want to call it. And obviously, as you drink more, you become increasingly intoxicated as you keep anaesthetizing your sort of central nervous system. But the problem is the brain reacts to things. So your brain has a huge array of its own naturally produced chemicals, drugs and hormones, things you would have heard about, like um, cortisol and adrenaline and dopamine and endorphins. These are all chemicals, drugs and hormones that your brain creates and excretes. Now, It's a very complicated process and we humans don't fully understand it. But what we do know is the brain works by way of something called homeostasis. So that that is just a fancy word for a balance of all these chemicals, drugs and hormones. So when you take alcohol, which is a sedative, your brain realizes that there's been an imbalance to this homeostasis, this balance. So it tries to address the balance. Now, alcohol being a sedative, it does, your brain does lots of things, but one of the things it does is really stimulant. So you've got depressants that make you feel sleepy and relax you, and you've got um, stimulants like caffeine and amphetamines that wake you up and make you feel more alert. Nicotine as well is a stimulant. So when you take alcohol, which is a sedative, your brain counters it by re- releasing like adrenaline and cortisol, which is a stress hormone, to counter the anaesthetizing, sedating effects of the alcohol. So I sometimes think of it like those old fashioned weighing scales, you know, the bar that sort of pivots in the middle and you've got a basket hanging off each end. So if you think of it, you've got stimulants and depressants as each of the baskets and you've got a small amount in each one. If you put a load in the sedative side, obviously it tips up. So your brain puts a load in the stimulant side to balance it. So you go back to being balanced. But then, of course, the alcohol doesn't stay in your system forever. It gets processed and removed. So when that happens the bar tips the other way um so another way of explaining it really is as simple as for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction so whatever sedating anaesthetizing you get from a drink you get a corresponding feeling of anxiety and uptightness when it wears off um so there's a few points to take away from that firstly from a completely like mental perspective it doesn't relax you. Well, it does. It may make you feel slightly more sedated, but then whenever it wears off, you get that corresponding feeling of anxiety. Now, one drink will be a minor feeling of anxiety. Three, four, five drinks will be larger and larger and larger feeling of anxiety. But because your brain releases cortisol and adrenaline to counter it, those two things put your blood, your blood pressure and heart rate up. So, Although you feel relaxed, your body's going into a stress. So people who wear um, fitness trackers that monitor your stress levels, I think Garmin do it. Um, When you drink alcohol, your body goes into a huge stress response. So it manifests itself as massive stress because your heart rate's gone up, your blood pressure's gone up. So although you feel mentally relaxed, your body's having this massive stress hormone so, so it does two things. One, it doesn't relax you mentally, or it does, but then there's a corresponding feeling of anxiety, so you're paying when you come down off it. But secondly, your body just goes into this massive stress um, response. Got it. And so, you, you know, you've had your drink, and everybody talks about that moment of the, the sigh, of the, oh, you know, that kind of relaxation that everybody seems to seems to miss. But what's mm-hmm. actually happening is your body's going into uh, a response or a reaction that's quite counter to the relaxed, relaxed state. 
and then there's all these stress hormones and other chemicals that are going to create the anxiety five six hours later is that yeah that's pretty much it and the other thing of course is this uh, unpleasant feeling you get I, I refer to it as withdrawal and it is a withdrawal I mean some people think of alcohol withdrawals as kind of like DTs and really extreme things like alcohol induced seizures and all the rest of it but for me a withdrawal is an unpleasant feeling caused by a chemical imbalance that is itself caused by the previous dose of the drug wearing off so for me that unpleasant feeling you get is alcohol withdrawal it usually hangs around even at low levels for like 24 to 36 hours so people who are drinking regularly you just described it as that that sigh that lovely feeling you get it's actually no more than getting back to how you'd feel had you not had a drink in the first place because you're feeling uptight and anxious because you've got that chemical imbalance so there's two ways you can get rid of that chemical imbalance one is to wait a few days for your brain chemistry to get back to normal but there's a far quicker way and that's to take another drink because you're feeling uptight and nervous because your brain's geared up to work under the stating effects of the alcohol but there's no alcohol present so if you take a drink you immediately feel better so for daily drinkers the great pleasure they're getting you know that lovely sigh feeling you get of just oh peace and harmony and everything's good again that's what you get all the time if you don't drink obviously you have ups and downs and you get things that stress you but your default position is to feel you know relaxed and confident yeah I, I can totally relate to that because I, I feel that now without the substance but a lot of people are really stuck aren't they in that total mm. cycle and they're relieving the symptoms of the alcohol with the substance that's creating the symptoms <laughs> yeah yeah it, it, it's a horrible cycle to be in and it's incredibly hard to get out of it because I know at the time I, 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 I sort of did an Instagram post a while ago and it was um how it felt to me is like you're in rough seas clinging onto a raft and the rough seas of life and all the ups and downs it gives you and alcohol is the raft and you're clinging onto it and you can't imagine letting go of it um, and then various things happen and you let go. And to me, the analogy is you actually find you're standing in like two foot of water. You're absolutely, you didn't need the raft at all. And that's what it was like. You're sort of clinging on desperately, not really happy, not being able to control anything, but just clinging on for dear life to this raft and then letting go and thinking, I just didn't need it at all. Yeah. I'm, I'm suddenly standing on my own two feet again. And it's incredibly hard to see when you're in that cycle because you're going through that heightened anxiety and the only time you feel good is when you take that drink and the thought of letting go of alcohol is incredibly intimidating because you just think of the rest of your life with that horrible anxious feeling but actually it disappears after just a few days yeah absolutely I love that that image you know it's kind of almost comical when you think about it yeah. we're all desperately hanging on to this thing and yeah. you, you let go and you're standing up and you're just fine but it does yeah. I do want to speak to that chapter the mental agony of stopping and you talk about that schizophrenic battle. Um, I think it's also this cognitive dissonance is another way that people would talk about it. Can you share a little bit about the mental agony because the physical part we talked about what about the psychological. So there, there, there's a few points to sort of talk about there one of the big things. Um, is obviously the craving process because a lot of people when they're trying to quit they talk about craving and you know, I get really bad cravings and they talk of it almost like a, a thing that just happens externally and you either have to suffer it or give into it but actually craving is a specific conscious thought process mm -hmm. so what happens is you get your trigger the thought of an alcoholic drink enters your mind um, and if you start obsessing about it and fantasizing about it that's all you're doing. So you're taken up entirely with this thing. And this is why a lot of people say, I can't stop thinking about alcohol when they quit. But lots of, so, so you and I have quit drinking. You know, you, you said you were five years, which is absolutely fantastic. Congratulations. And I'm 10 years. And we're sitting here talking about alcohol now. So we're obviously thinking about it, but we're not craving it. Yeah. So the difference is, I, you know, I probably spend, I don't know, 80% of my life thinking about and talking about alcohol, but I never actually crave it because the difference is I don't sit there and think, wouldn't it be lovely to have a drink? Aren't I miserable because I can't have one? Maybe I can have one on just this occasion. And 
if you go into that thought process, that's the craving process. And it's a very unpleasant kind of mental toing and froing. Um, and the trouble is it distracts you from whatever you're doing in life. So, you know, if you come in from a tough day at work and you just want to relax and have some food and watch a box set or read a book or you're out with friends or you're on holiday or Christmas or family barbecues, whatever it is, all of those things are inherently enjoyable, but they're only enjoyable if you're concentrating on them and enjoying them. If instead of enjoying the event, 90% of your attention is taken up with an unpleasant internal tantrum about wanting something that you can't have, you're not going to enjoy it. So again, there's a few ways you can get rid of cravings. Um, I've probably got time to talk through it all now because it's quite an intricate, intricate process. <laughs> but the easiest and most superficial ways is to just take a drink. Because you're not sat there fantasizing about it and having it distract you if you've got one in your hand. So that kind of feeds into this very deeply held belief that, like I had when I quit, I'm not going to enjoy social occasions or holidays or anything without an alcoholic drink. Because that was my experience when I wasn't drinking. I couldn't enjoy it. Mm. So, again, we have these beliefs that these events are enhanced with alcohol. But all it really does is it, it removes your ability to enjoy it and then sort of restores it to you. Um, and one of the obvious, most obvious examples of it is children. If you look at children, they go to parties, holidays, everything, and they have a fantastic time and they don't need alcohol. And we didn't need alcohol until we started having it. And then all of a sudden these events, you know, it becomes absolutely indispensable for these events. Yeah. And and it's so true. I mean, as we, you know, we've talked about before over and over, it's everywhere, right? Alcohol is absolutely everywhere in society at the moment. So we're mm -hmm. not only do we feel it in ourselves, we see it whenever we step outside. So yeah. we've got that environment, environmental influence too. Yeah, it to that degree, I think alcohol is probably the toughest drug to quit, purely because you know, most other drugs when you quit, like smoking or whatever, it's seen in a bad light generally. And you can quit and very soon sort of form this positive image of it. But alcohol, more than any other drug, is still celebrated. Um, so, you know, you, you turn on the TV, there's programs with people drinking, there's films with people drinking, songs social media we've been bombarded with the positive good side of you know you don't get that to the same degree with smoking or metham methamphetamines or cocaine or heroin or anything like that yeah. but it's incredibly difficult to maintain that perspective of i don't want to drink anymore when you're constantly being bombarded with the positive image of it so that is why for me it is the most difficult drug to quit because you you've got this constant bombardment of the the fun healthy side of alcohol yeah which is why i think you know people like you writing these books and talking about it you know we have to keep talking about it because we've got to remain mm. conscious and and be more and more educated educate other people so that when they're bombarded from the outside they've got some tools and ammunition yeah absolutely their, their knowledge and awareness um yeah. so the other myth that I would love to talk to you about, because I know you feel really strongly about this, is sleep. Um, yes. Because a yeah. lot of people say it helps them to sleep. So what would you say about that? So there's two sort of strands to this. I've already touched on how when you take alcohol, you, you sedate your brain, but then it goes into an oversensitive phase. So you've got that sort of, sort of balance going on, <clears throat> almost like a swing, swinging one way and then swinging back the other way. Um, then to apply it to sleep, I think very quickly, it's useful just to understand a bit about sleep. A lot of people just vaguely think that sleep is, you know, you fall into bed, you go unconscious for a few hours, you wake up and you're good to go. It, it's not as simple as that. When you sleep naturally, you go through very specific sleep cycles. So very, very briefly, there's deep sleep, which, as you can imagine, you're very deeply unconscious. But there's another sleep cycle called REM sleep, which stands for rapid eye movement, because when you're asleep, your eyes flicker, even though your eyes are closed. Um, it's a very interesting sleep part of the sleep cycle, because when they um, monitor people in REM sleep, their brain lights up almost as if they're fully awake. It's um, it's when you dream. So the dreams come in REM sleep. 
Whereas with deep sleep, your body is physically regenerating and recuperating. REM sleep is when you're mentally processing things and your brain and mental health is actually um, recuperating. Okay, so it's a hugely important part of sleep. They've done tests on rats where they've starved them of REM sleep and they've been dead within a few weeks. They've done volunteer studies with humans where it sounds like it sounds horrible. You you go up to this sleep clinic and you sleep there and they attach sensors to you. And when you go into REM sleep, they wake you up. So they don't stop you sleeping. They just stop you getting REM sleep. And within a day or two, people become very depressed, very disorientated. So it has a massive effect on your mental health. Now, when you drink alcohol, for the first part of the evening, or the first part of your sleep, the first four or five hours, you're too heavily sedated to go into REM sleep. Mm. So there was a statistic I heard the other day where I think the average amount of REM sleep is two and a half hours. Naturally, that's what you should be getting each night. Mm. If you have one or two alcohol or alcoholic drinks, so not a massive amount, one or two will halve it. And then I think a couple more than that drags it down to like half an hour. So you're on to like a fifth of what you should be getting. Um, and more than five or six, you get almost none at all. So you're having this massive impact on your REM sleep. Now, alcohol has a half-life of five hours. What half-life means is how long it takes for the amount of drug in your system to drop by half. So if you have 10 units, within five hours, it's dropped to five okay so what we normally find is when you hit that five hour mark because the sedatives have dropped and the stimulant side starting to kick in you wake up um it's almost like drinking this is what i often say to people say you sleep from 11 at night to seven in the morning that's eight hours okay that's you at your best drinking alcohol is like setting an alarm for three or four in the morning and getting up and drinking seven or eight mugs of strong black coffee to lie there twitching and you know oh. your mind that that's what happens it's the equivalent because that's when the alcohol drops and the stimulants kick in and that's why people find they usually wake up almost exactly five hours after their last drink to be unable to get back to sleep your body can be exhausted and crying out for sleep but you can't physically sleep because you've got all those stimulants kicking around in your system Okay. And is that what people call anxiety? Yeah, exactly. It's the same right. side of it. It's almost like drinking, you know, when you drink too much caffeine and you feel very on edge and nervous and you can't sleep, it's exactly the same thing. Yeah. Um, so the point there is alcohol has a massive impact on your REM sleep. And, you know, again, just to give a sort of a brief snippet of the summary, there's a whole world of difference between alcohol induced in unconsciousness and sleep. So get that into your mind alcohol induced unconsciousness is not sleep the biggest reported symptom of a hangover is tiredness and even one or two drinks will interrupt your natural sleeping cycle so it doesn't matter whether you're drinking a dozen drinks every night or just one every couple of days it has a huge impact on your sleeping cycle so it ruins your sleep and makes you feel tired <laughs> is the yeah. short answer but the other branch to this that I mentioned at the beginning, so slightly separate this. So you or I, you and I don't drink. OK, so when we get towards bedtime, our brain naturally starts releasing more sedatives to calm things down. It starts closing everything down and we drift into a natural and restorative sleep. Um, and that's why we've talked so much about good sleep hygiene, you know, get away from the white lights, um, have a bedroom only for sleeping, you know, a hot bath or relax or dim the lights or whatever. And all that really is, is sending the message to your brain to say, right, it's bedtime, start closing everything down so we can go into, as I say, natural sleep. When you drink alcohol regularly, your brain doesn't go through that process because it just relies on the sedating effects of the alcohol. So your brain's doing it you start drinking each evening and your brain doesn't go through that closed down process why would it need to because it knows that every night it's got this sedative coming into its system that closes things down for it you know the brain's a great adapter it adapts when we drink and it adapts when we stop drinking so what people find is if you're drinking regularly and you have a night off you'll find it incredibly hard to get to sleep 
because your brain's not used to going through this closing down process. And actually, you have to wait three to five days. for It doesn't take long, but it is a few nights when your sleep's impacted before your brain realises, oh, this sedative no longer here. I need to stop picking up the slack and doing it myself. But the problem is that's people's experience. So if you're drinking every day or most days and you have a day off, you find it incredibly hard to fall to sleep. And then the next day you have a drink and you can go to sleep easily or sleep in inverted commas. It's actually, as I say, alcohol induced unconsciousness, which isn't sleep anyway. But that's what happens. So people end up with these very deeply held beliefs that alcohol helps you sleep because their personal experience is I can fall asleep when I'm drinking but when I'm not, I simply cannot sleep at all. Yeah. So it creates that horrible nightmare situation where they're getting increasingly tired because they're drinking and they're not going through the right sleep cycles. Sleep becomes increasingly precious. But when they try and stop, they can't sleep. So they're almost clinging on even harder to alcohol because it's the only way they can get to sleep. And as I say, they're becoming increasingly tired, not realizing that actually you need to jettison it completely have a few nights of bad sleep before you get back to normal, then catch up on sleep. And that's when the tiredness finally leaves you for good. Yeah. yeah. It's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, when you mm. think about it, we've, we're all running around thinking it helps me relax. It relieves my stress. It relieves my anxiety. It helps me sleep. But the reality is that it actually causes those problems. And therefore we're trying to relieve those problems with the thing that caused them. I think that's yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think this kind of stuff was the information I did have when I quit drinking. And I think that's what gave me the key to stopping is that I knew after a few days, my brain chemistry would get back to normal. I'd feel much better. I'd start sleeping better. I knew that in a week or two, I'd start to feel much, much better. And that was what gave me the key to quitting. And it was then over time that I found like social occasions, vacations, holidays, Christmas, all that were not only enjoyable, but actually more enjoyable without alcohol. I think that's how it all sort of pieced together for me. I think that mindset so pivotal to long term success, the mindset that it's actually, life is actually going to be better without it. Mm. What would you say to people in terms of how do we really get ourselves to look at it in that way because everything's telling us you're going to miss out you're mm -hmm. going to you know you, as you said it's going to be miserable yeah. so what would you say to people perhaps that are listening that are like yeah but you know I don't want to miss out and I want to have mm -hmm. fun and all those things that come up I, I would so my experience is you do have fun again you absolutely do and like I say you actually enjoy it more when when you socialize your brain releases something called um endorphins to make you feel really good so a lot of the time when you're drinking and socializing that buzz you get that feels really nice is actually mainly the endorphins um, when you quit drinking it takes a while to settle back into social occasions but when you do you get that buzz. Now, when you're drinking over the course of the evening, you eventually anaesthetize that buzz. So the drinkers appear very animated and happy when they're drinking. If you look at them two or three hours later, the mood's dropped massively. And that's when you get the arguments and all the rest of it is because, but you, when you're not drinking, actually feel good for the whole evening. So to a degree, you have to trust the system. But the other thing I would say, which is a bit, may sound a bit counterintuitive, don't expect to enjoy it immediately and the reason I say this I was talking to someone the other day who was really struggling with these social occasions with this particular point like I can't go out and enjoy myself without alcohol everyone else seems to be able to do it and I think the problem was she was going day one expecting to really enjoy herself and of course you're probably not going you know if, if, if you haven't socialized without a drink in hand for the past 20 30 years it takes a bit of time to get on with it. And I think this was why my mindset of a life, certain parts of life are going to be awful. I'm not going to enjoy them actually helped me because I think if I would started off thinking, well, I'm going to quit drinking. Everyone seems to enjoy social events when they're not drinking. So I'm going to go to my first social event and expect to really enjoy it. I probably wouldn't have enjoyed it. And it would have been kind of like a massive blow to my morale and my determination to keep going but I was going with the mindset 
this is going to be miserable because when I stopped, I avoided as many social occasions as I could. But of course, you can't avoid all of them. There's stuff that comes up that you absolutely have to go to. So I was going with the mindset that I don't want to go. I'm not going to enjoy a second of it. And in fact, forget enjoying it. I'm just going to feel awkward and <laughs> really deeply uncomfortable. But I have to just stand there and feel awful for four or five hours and then I can leave. And that's what I'm going to do. I'll just stand there and hate it and wait for it to be over. And that was my mindset. That's socialising for me. And of course, you turn up feeling like that, but you have some food, you have a couple of alcohol free drinks, you end up chatting to someone. And soon, I think even on my first event, I was suddenly like, do you know what? I've been talking to someone and quite enjoying the conversation. And I wouldn't say I was enjoying myself, but I wasn't acutely miserable. And then I was like, oh, that's interesting. So there was a chunk of those four or five hours where I wasn't miserable. And I started thinking about that. And it was like, okay, so it's when I kind of forget all the stuff that's going on. And I used to use alcohol to forget that. But actually, you can forget it by getting into an interesting conversation with someone, for example, which is what socialising is all about. Really? So Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> Not the alcohol. Shock horror. So for me, it was a good way of doing it because instead of expecting it to be fantastic and it wasn't fantastic so it would have really knocked my you know my determination and my commitment to not drinking I did it the other way around I expected it to be awful and actually it wasn't quite so awful and it was like it was quite a nice pleasant surprise and then of course having done it once you're turning up at the next one not quite so on edge because you're like actually there was a bit of it, it was all right so I was going and not expecting it to be really awful, expecting it to just be awful <laughs> and <laughs> relax a bit more and it's slightly better. And so it, it took time for me to get there. So that's what I would say to people who are struggling with the social aspect. Different people are different. Some people are very extroverted and I know people who quit and their first social event they go to and it's like, oh, it was brilliant, really enjoyed it. You might get that if you're lucky, but my advice would be, it's almost like ex hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. Expect it to be awful. And then if it's anything less, it's like, oh, well, actually, that's OK. That's, you know, and it gives you hope. And like I say, we used to be able to socialise without alcohol as a child. OK, all stopping drinking is, it's relearning a skill you used to have, i.e. socialising sober. But for me, it took a number of events to get back there. Other people will do it immediately, but it does take a bit of time. It's a short answer. Yeah, and I love that that realism because I think with a lot of the messaging out there on social media, it's all or can be very, woohoo, look, this is amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And what yeah. can happen, I think, you know, people see that and then they don't have that experience. And so it's reinforcing the misery. Oh, my God. It, you know, yeah. that difference, they're different. I'm, you know, I'm yeah. worse. Um, I know this is a tricky question, but I'm wondering if you can give an indication of how long one might expect to wait before they see the benefits, the physiological benefits of, you know, the sleep, I only mentioned a five nights maybe, but, you know, the better sleep, the better mental health, energy, all those sorts of things that will allow someone to see that it's worth it because this is, yeah, yeah. we need to see that it's worth it, right? Yeah, absolutely. So what happens is when you stop drinking, I think the alcohol usually leaves your system, e even in a very heavy drinker, 24 to 36 hours after you stopped. But about five hours in, the level of alcohol will drop in comparison to the stimulants that are in your system. So that's when you'll feel really anxious. The worst case is that anxiety, that additional anxiety will tail off by days three to five. What people usually find is it peaks after about 24 hours and then slowly goes and it should disappear between three to five days gone entirely. So what you'll find for the first few days, you'll feel very uptight. You won't be able to probably eat particularly well. Um, you'll find sleeping very difficult, as we talked about. Um, and then you come out the other side of that and you start sleeping really well. So you're out of that anxious stage, but then you almost go the other way because, you know, if you've been drinking for 20, 30 years fairly regularly, you haven't had a proper sleep for that entire period. Okay, so there's a massive amount of catch up that your body needs to go through. 
So what happens is people spend the first few days feeling anxious, not being able to sleep, and then they go completely the other way. Now, what they will find is they're really lacking in energy, really heavy, really lethargic, and they just want to sleep all the time. That period of needing to sleep is it's incredibly hard to put a time scale on it because it can be anything from a couple of nights at the extreme outside four months, okay, which is quite a long period. But let me just explain where the four months comes from. So I've, you know, as you said, I stopped drinking 10 years. I wrote the book nearly 10 years ago, and I've had a lot of contact with an awful lot of people and found out their experiences of stopping until very recently, the longest period of I, I've heard of that tired feeling was three months. Mm -hmm. Then very not long ago at all, someone said it was four months for them. So this is the extreme outside what people will find is it's usually quicker than that. So a few weeks, hopefully a month or so. The, the average, I think, for, for even bad cases is usually about four weeks to a month. And what people find is they're feeling very heavy, very lethargic, very lacking in energy. And it's almost like one day they just wake up and think, oh, wow, I feel different. Because they it's as quick as that. You literally one day just wake up feeling different. And that's when it hits people okay so this is what not drinking is all about so to a degree you have to trust the system and know that it gets better if you're feeling very heavy and tired and lethargic it doesn't last forever and i promise you it's so worth it when you come out the other side because that is the thing where you and i sit there and go it feels so good when you're not drinking and that's what we're talking about when you come out of that other side so worst case well few weeks month but absolute worst case three months but just to highlight aside from that craving is a psychological process and you can crave at any time about anything you know if you're fantasizing about something you want but you can't have and it's distracting you from everything else you're fantasizing you know you're craving so it is possible for the craving to outlast all of the physiological chemical side of things yeah just as a warning yeah but I, th I think it's so important to normalize the fact that this process of really feeling the benefits is different for everybody and yeah. if you're not feeling the sleep after five days it's it doesn't mean that's not going to happen for you that we're all Correct. different yeah. and I think this is so important as well to share with the audience that it's very much a unique experience, but mm. ultimately you cannot lose by removing a number one rated carcinogen <laughs> from, your, <laughs> from your daily consumption habits. Yes, um, absolutely. It, and let, let's talk about that. I mean, it's, it's up there, right? It's a, it's a number one cancer, causing substance yeah absolutely so the medical branch of the world health organization classifies things in terms of how carcinogenic they are to human beings um and class one they've got cigarette smoking asbestos radiation and alcohol it's a it's a massive carcinogen people will say you know it's got health benefits it has zero health benefits. It's incredibly detrimental, not only because it's a carcinogenic, but it increases your heart rate and blood pressure, which again, I probably haven't got time to go into too much detail on, but both of those things are incredibly bad for you from a cardiovascular perspective. In the long term, it gives you a heart attack in your late 40s, early 50s. And in the short term, it makes you feel very heavy um, and lacking in energy because when your heart rate and blood pressure goes up your body tries to slow things down so it makes you want to sit down and rest which is another reason you're lacking in energy when you're drinking regularly apart from the lack of sleep um, and people will always jump up and say oh you know but there's this study that shows beer is good for your red wine is good for you let's just simplify this now okay <laughs> Can we Alcohol talk has, shit on that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let me be very straightforward about this. Alcohol has zero health benefits. It's actually incredibly detrimental to your health. Red wine, let's take red wine because that's the classic thing. Grapes are good for you, right? 
they're a fruit they're high in vitamin c lots of nutrients minerals and vitamins in them okay so when you take alcohol you're taking what is essentially grape juice which is good for you and alcohol which is incredibly bad for you mixing it together so when you look at these studies that say a glass of red wine is good for you they're never saying the alcohol is good for you they're saying there is something else in this glass that we've got in front of us that is good for you it's not the alcohol so if you want the benefit of that, eat some red grapes, have some fresh grape juice, you'll get all the benefits and none of the downside. And in fact, it's much, much worse than that because the fermentation process destroys virtually all of the vitamins, nutrients that are in grapes. So grapes are highly nutritious, full of vitamin C, et cetera, et cetera. Loads of good things in there. When you turn it into lot wine, you're essentially leaving it to rot. So it produces this very powerful carcinogen and it destroys the vast majority of the vitamins, minerals and nutrients that are good for you. So to give an example, grapes are very, very high in vitamin C. Wine has zero vitamin C and you can do a comparison between all of it. One of the very few, if not the only thing in there that is not impacted by the fermentation process is antioxidants. So it's about the only thing where the antioxidants in grapes and wine are virtually the same. And that's what people tell you is good for you. Yeah. <laughs> so right. they produce this thing and say, oh, there's loads of antioxidants in it. And it's like, well, you've taken something, you've let it rot, which has destroyed virtually all of the nutrients apart from these antioxidants. It's also produced this very powerful chemical that's a carcinogen, class one carcinogen, and extremely damaging for your cardiovascular health. No, it's not good for you at all. You know, forget the wine, have a, a few grapes. Some grapes. It's terrifying, really, when you think about it, because from, to my experience, any article that says alcohol is good for you in some shape or form is are, are articles that get shared and spread because it's the message mm -hmm. everybody wants to hear right but yeah, when you're absolutely. talking like you're talking now which is the truth this stuff is not widely consumed because people are still so attached to mm. their drinking habit what yeah. do you think we need to do i mean to get this out there more i mean obviously we're doing this we're talking today um what else what else can we do? It is incredibly difficult because at the end of the day, journalists write pieces that they want people to want to read. That's what it all comes down to. I remember being on Facebook a while ago and there was a, one of those stupid memes about red wine being good for you. And I went back to the site that published it. And funnily enough, the previous post, they'd done about someone who quit drinking. Okay, so they're like quite a positive piece. The one about red wine being good for you had, I don't know, like 10,000 likes and 1,000 shares. The one about someone stopping drinking had 100 likes and one share. And that's the problem. Um, and obviously, Facebook, Instagram, all this social media, it works on algorithms. So the more people look at stuff, the more it shoves it under your nose. And the problem is when you're consuming alcohol, you don't really want to stop, or at least a big part of you doesn't want to stop because you can't imagine enjoying life without it. So if someone shoves something under your face saying it's bad for you, you sort of brush it away and ignore it. Whereas if someone puts something under your nose saying, oh, it's actually good for you, you're right. It's, oh, yeah, great. I'll really concentrate on that because it makes it easier to keep doing it, which is what part of you wants to do. You don't want the difficult thing of having to face up to the reality. So I think all we can do is keep doing what we're doing at the moment. And I think two things. Firstly, what we're saying is actually true. So the truth will out. It takes a long time, but it will get there in the end. Um, and secondly, the alcohol free movement's gathering a lot of speed and more and more people are drinking. When I wrote Alcohol Explained, it was kind of like people had to have a serious alcohol problem before they wanted to stop. That was the big question. I know, am I alcoholic? Whereas now this question's shifting more to, is this a beneficial part of my life? Forget whether I'm chemically or psychologically or whatever dependent on it. Is it worth doing it? Is it bringing me more joy than it is pain? And when you start getting under the skin of it, you realise it isn't. So as more and more people join the alcohol-free movement, so you know we're encouraging the truth to get out there. So I think that's all we can really keep doing. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think it, it, to your point earlier about the cigarettes, 
it's like our drinking alcohol eventually may become something that we look at as a bit mm, what, are you, mm -hmm. what are you doing that for whereas at the moment it's quite the opposite but there's definitely a, a change isn't there in in how definitely. to see Yes. And um, so, William, thank you so much for your time this evening. For me, it's this evening anyway. I'm not sure you it's bright and early for you. Um, but I wanted to tell the listeners that this book, um, you have offered the first five chapters for free on your website. We'll have a link to that um, under the podcast in the notes. Is there anything else that you'd like to share finally as a, a leaving piece of wisdom? Because people that are listening to this podcast are generally in what we call contemplation and they're thinking about it. Um, what, what would you have to say to them before we finish up? If I would say for me, a lot of the thing that kept me going back to my drinking was my beliefs about it. So it helped me relax. It helped me sleep. It was my escape from all the stresses and strains. And the problem was, I think, for me for a while, they were such deeply held beliefs. I didn't even think of them as beliefs. I thought of them as fact because that was my experience of it. So what I would say is take nothing for granted. OK, so don't sit there and think, OK, I'm, I'm happy when I'm drinking. I'm not happy when I'm not drinking. Therefore, not drinking will be me eternally being unhappy start to question everything. And a lot of people will tell you when quitting a drug, you know, you make a list of all the downside to it and sort of cling on to that. I found it more beneficial to do it the other way around. Make a list of all the reasons you want to keep drinking or you think you'll find it hard to stop drinking or why alcohol is a positive in whatever way or you need it. And then start going through them and asking, you'll really get under the skin of it, get very curious um, and start understanding a bit more of the dynamic and ask yourself is you know each one is that right is really how does it work this way and is is it genuinely helping or is it illusion and it's actually doing me more harm because we've touched on a few of these during during our chat today um and actually you can you like hopefully like me you'll find a lot of the things that keep drawing you in are actually false and when you start removing those, you start to shift your perspective quite dramatically. And certainly for me, not drinking is not about resisting alcohol. It's about genuinely not wanting it anymore. Yeah, yeah which is a totally different experience to the white knuckling, yeah. which um, I think we, just to share with the, with the listeners as well, that your book is also a book that can be read while the person is still drinking mm, right? but you, absolutely, you yeah. through that process so i think that's wonderful um so you can read the book without too much fear um, yeah <laughs> it's like kind of it, it might not be the best analogy but you know like if you're going to do something difficult like climb a mountain or run a marathon you, you don't just go and do it you prepare first and for me you know, preparing to quit something is getting the knowledge about it before you actually undertake the attempt to do it. So that's not to say if you already quit drinking, you should start again before. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely not. No, no, no. No, it's, yeah, it's not necessary to quit beforehand. Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, William. It's been a pleasure chatting to you. Really appreciate your time. No, thank you for inviting um, me. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. I know there's another book too, Alcohol Explained too. Yep. Yes. So we will keep being educated and with education Fantastic. comes power. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, William.